Hello, and welcome to the October 2013 edition of MPS Today. We're excited about the show that we have for you today. You'll meet teacher Melissa DeBoer and several of her business students uh, from Dow High School as they introduce you to the Charger Shop. We'll hear from the high school counselors in the latest edition of the Counselor's Corner, and teachers Sharon DeReese and Bernadette Wood will talk to us about their science club and the international incident they created last summer. Where can you watch the show? There are many places. Your local cable channel 98, on UVerse channel 99, select Midland Community Television and then select Midland Public Schools, or on our YouTube site, www.youtube.com slash user slash Midland Public Schools, or midps.org slash YouTube. Both those sites will take you to the same place. Uh, portions of the show are also available on the school websites as well. When you go to our YouTube site, you can also subscribe to the site. There's a red button in the top corner where you can do that, and then you'll receive updates every time that we add a new show. Now, our first guests today are from Dow High School. We welcome teacher Melissa DeBoer and students Elena Donoso and Jeffrey Sale. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. You bet. Now, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, first, Mr. DeBoer, tell us about your teaching, where you teach, and, and what you do there. I teach at Dow High School. Mm -hmm and I teach marketing, point two and point three, merchandising, point two and point three, and sales, point two and point three. Okay. And how long have you been at Dow High School? Uh, this is my 10th year. Great. And how about you guys, Jeffrey? Um, I'm a junior at Dow High School right now. Um, I compete in several sports in the school and I'm currently enrolled in Mrs. DeBoer's sales class. Enjoy it very much. All right, great. How about you, Elena? Um, I moved to Midland actually a year ago from Japan. I'm from Brazil and um, I'm really loving Dow High School and right. I've been enrolled in two of Mrs. DeBoer's classes. Okay. So yeah, it's very, it's, you I found a it. great teacher and you're sticking with <laughs> it. Right? Now what year in school are you? I'm a senior this year. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, so what do you guys like to do? Uh, you mentioned that you do some wrestling and uh, what, do you, what else do you both like to do when you're not uh, in classes and studying? Um, yeah, I enjoy wrestling. I also do a bit of running. I think I'm going to train for a marathon in the spring. Well, um, also inv involved with uh, youth organizations in my church. Okay. How about you, Elena? Um, I am in the DECA Business Club with Mrs. DeBoer as well. Um, I am president of the Habitat for Humanity Club at Dow. And I also do drama. So, right. yeah. Sounds like you guys are, uh, are very busy. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mrs. DeBoer, tell us, uh, what do you enjoy most about your teaching? Working with the students, yeah. uh, watching them make the connections, seeing the light finally go off. Um, I think one of the most rewarding things about the sales class, though, has been having more students <laughs> actually work in the store, get some real-world experience, communication. I have students that have been very shy when they come in, barely able to stand up in front of the class, and at the end, they're outgoing, they have lots of new friends, and mm -hmm. it can really make a difference in their lives. Sure, absolutely. Well, tell us more about the Charger Shop. So uh, for folks that haven't been in Dow High School, you know, where is it? What do you do there? And, and how does it contribute to the environment at Dow High School? Oh, well, the Charger Shop is located right down from Student Services, and it's attached to my marketing and merchandising and sales classroom. It really helps create the Charger Spirit culture that okay. Mrs. Castle um, and the entire community is really involved in. We are able to sell all kinds of Charger gear and merchandise. We have clothing, we have spirit items. We also sell drinks and food, as well as um, pencils and notebooks and all kinds of great stuff for the students and the staff. Sure, okay. Now, how do you choose students to work in the Charger shop? Uh, and I imagine the merchandising and sales classes are involved in that. Absolutely. Typically what I do is anyone that is enrolled in point three level sales or merchandising will be working in the charger shop at some point in time. If you are in the fourth hour point three sales or merchandising class, you will actually be giving up one entire day a week to work in the school store during lunch period. Um, Helena and Four other students were chosen as managers. At the end of each school year, I ask students that are interested in being managers to apply, and they fill out applications. I check with teachers, um, reference checks, basically sure. check grades, reliability, dependability, and then from there, we I pick the store managers. Those students work every single day, or work one day a week, and then they are in charge of five other students during their shift. 
So for example, when Elena works on, what, what is your day, is it? On the Tuesday. Tuesday, she will come in Tuesday morning, work before okay. school, she'll work after school, and she'll work both lunches. During both lunches, she's in, she's in charge of five other students. So that's kind of how that works. <laughs> so Elena, how's your first uh, management experience going so far? Oh, I love it. <laughs> we started actually during summer to sort of get the training going on and we had to do all of the stock and inventory of all mm -hmm. items. And I don't know, it's very different actually having hands on on what we do instead of just like reading it on the book and everything. Sure. And the customer experience of being face to face with the customer and I don't know, it's just, I love it. It's, it's really a unique experience. It, it has to be, there's no comparison I would imagine to reading out of a book oh. and actually experience working in the store, right? Oh so. yeah. yeah. Now when you come back to class, do you guys, do, uh, do I imagine you spent some time talking about, okay, what's happened, how did it go, what, what are those discussions like? Jeffrey, jump in here too. When you guys have those talks, what do you talk about? <laughs> um, well, we. From the sales class, we're kind of in charge of choosing what we think are going to bring more customers and like pitching okay. ideas, maybe saying we should try to sell these types of clothes or this kind of food to bring in more, um, more of the students coming in to buy stuff. So it's cool to be involved that way, being able to make decisions that can affect the, the profit of the store. Right. Yeah. And after every, um, after every day, um, the managers actually like count all the money that we made and to see if we are right on check to see if we actually have all of the um, money there. And I don't know, it's, it's just very different. And we also, just like Jeffrey was saying, um, the target market, how we learn so much about who buys what. And yeah. because it's very impressive, like, like so many things I thought, do people really buy this? And it's like, teachers actually come in so much and I don't know it's just it gives you a feel for the market so so tell me about something that you have read about or uh, Mr. DeBoer has talked about in class that you then applied and then you went oh now I understand it better or now I see it differently can you think of something like that that's happened since you've been in the class the accounting change <laughs> yeah. oh wow yeah. yeah we um we actually I'm I'm new to sales and my first day working in the charger shop was actually yesterday <laughs> so um I had to take this this test where I had to count back change to a customer which I than did yesterday when I was working in the charger shop. And it's a, a little bit different because there's a line of people and you want <laughs> right, to get right. going fast and, <laughs> um, and help everybody at once. But it's, yeah, it's, I've definitely seen what I've learned in class being able to be applied in the shop. Sure. Yep, it's very fun. For DECA, we, um, I was in the food marketing um, part of the category. And just because in DECA we need to do role plays and solve business problems related to food marketing. And in the charger shop, you actually see that come alive. So yeah. it's quite an experience. It's a whole different level of learning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, Mr. DeBoer, talk with us a little bit about that. How do, what have you seen over the years that uh, students learn much better applying in the store than they would have if you just had a uh, you know, closed classroom approach to it? Well. It wasn't until a couple years ago that we actually started putting entire classes through the charger shop. Um, it was typically run by two co-op students, and those were the only two students that really were allowed that experience. Sure. But as of the last couple years, we decided to really make it a classroom project, a true, I guess you would call it more of a PBL, project-based learning experience, mm -hmm. um, the truest sense of the word. Sometimes they're learning things first in the store before we're even able to cover them in class. So then they have something to pull from because they've experienced it, right. whether it's customer service, um, buyer motivation, the sales process in general. So there's lots of different things that way. Um, I think the biggest thing is that kids can really understand how business operates. So many times students don't understand that when you go into a store and you purchase something, they think, oh, they're making all kinds of money. But they don't understand that there's cost behind that. The cost as far as what the inventory costs, what it costs for the computers, what it costs for the electricity, whatever it might be. Um, these students actually get a chance to, through the documenting of all the inventory, keeping track of all the book work, paying the bills, they get to see firsthand that, okay, we made this this month. <laughs> 
in our checkbook, but we had all these expenses that have come right. out. Right. So how do we balance that? I think that's probably one of the hardest things for students to understand out of a textbook, how important the financial aspect is and that you have to know where your money is. And through the charger shop, they see that absolutely firsthand. I also think the communication aspect is unbelievable for students because they're put in so many different situations that they wouldn't experience any other way. So even at the football games, um, we went there for the first time. I mean, the kids were all actually working the stands with charger shop clothing on sure. and walking the 40 yard yeah. line, <laughs> um, trying to get people to buy and really using sales skills that we haven't even really had a chance to discuss yet. But so as the year goes on, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt, but as the year goes on, you'll have a chance to talk about those experiences and and apply that, that to the Absolutely. concepts, right? You know, help them get better and learn more and what they've done right and things they can change to do things differently and maybe a little bit better. A lot of times we get so many great ideas from the students because they're a big market for us, obviously. It's not just staff and nobody wants, knows what they want right. besides oh, yeah. them. So we get great ideas from them and then we'll try to put those ideas into place. And I think that's something that's really very rewarding for kids. No question. Is when they say, hey, I've got this great promotional plan and then when everybody presents their plans, theirs is chosen. And then they watch it and see if how successful it, must it is. That's be awesome. Yeah, it's really great. We have to forgive us for a moment while we talk edu speak over here, you know. <laughs> but the idea of project-based learning, you know, real-world application of educational concepts. Uh, I've heard teachers talk about, heard educators talk about the idea that we're going to do a project as a culminating experience for a unit, and that's great. Uh, students often learn better that way than just straight from a textbook. I'm sure you probably have had that experience. But what you're talking about in project, true project-based learning takes it the extra mile, right, where, where the entire unit is essentially a project. Correct. And then you debrief, what do we learn from this? Right. And it's so powerful. It, you're not learning at the end. You're not doing, you're not going to work in the charter shop at the end of the school year. You're learning as we're going. They're reading and they're pulling from personal experiences. Um, we are going to have Toastmasters, the youth program, coming again this year. It was hugely successful last year. That will definitely help some of our students that aren't quite so outgoing and struggle with public speaking to talk to customers and really right. try to relate to them. That's just one of the ways through project-based learning you bring in experts from other areas that are more than just us. Um, we're actually going to work with Northwood this year as well um, with Jim Cleary and his advertising classes sure. as far as bringing those kids in and bringing experts in so the kids can pitch ideas to real business owners. That's a great community resource to draw <laughs> yep. on too. You know, it, uh, what, are, what are your goals? I, I'm sure the class is not just about running the store. No, it's not. So what are your goals? There's a symbiotic relationship there, but what are your goals for the class? Uh, what do you hope that by the end of the year, Elena and Jeffrey and their classmates have learned or accomplished? I hope that by the end of the year, in sales and merchandising that the students can take from it an appreciation of what a real business is about, how much hard work goes on behind oh the scenes, um, all the little nuances that need to be perfect to really make a business successful, that there's more than one person involved. Um, we do a lot of teamwork and we do a lot of group projects and because of that I think the kids learn how to communicate within a group. Um, they have to know when they're not there that they still have to have their work done. So we do a lot of things on the computers that the kids will be gone on vacation for a week on spring break, um, maybe a week early, but they are on their laptop somewhere working with their partners in the charger shop doing their projects. Sure. Because in the real world, you have to do that. Right. You sometimes have to work when you don't want to. So <laughs> you do. I know. So I, I think that's one of the things is, you know, make them responsible um, for the things that they commit to and help them really just kind of branch out and become successful and be able to do some public speaking sure. and get comfortable with themselves. That's real valuable too. So what was it like? Did either one of you have a chance to work the football game the other day? I mean, yeah. <laughs> what was that like? It was an awesome experience. We got we set up about an hour before the game actually started. We had to decide the location where we thought would be best to sell. We decided our target market would be the parents and so they sit up in the stands, so we went up there where nobody else was selling things, and it turned out to be really successful. Um, there was a lot of parents that stopped by and bought stuff from us. It was fun to, we, I had the chance to interact with a lot of them. I had one guy come up, he's like, 
Um, he wasn't sure if he wanted to buy anything, but I, I'm, I told him I'll do as many, as much as it costs you, I'll do that many push-ups. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. We, it was a good um, group effort to sell a lot of clothes, and then it was fun to set up and take down as well. Sure. Um, what I've been learning, not for, I haven't had the experience of the, tr of the football game yet, I'm doing that this week, but um, from when I started, which is only like almost two months ago because we started during summer, um, till now I have already learned so much because we have to order, we have to choose what to order, all, all, of, the, all of the laws, health laws, everything, sure. everything comes into place. Um, we also have our security system, so we have our cameras that we need to, I don't know, make sure that there's just so much that goes behind the scenes that I would have never imagined if I hadn't actually been on it and doing all of the work. And um, another thing that of um, the hands-on experience that I learned a lot with Mrs. DeBoer was last year in my marketing class where we actually opened our own little business for the Make-A-Wish project. Mm -hmm. And we produced goods and, and services and we had like two months to record our all financial expenses, how much profit we made and set goals and everything. And there is just so much that you learn with that and it is just great. It's I very really love involved, it. isn't it? Oh yeah. It's much more complicated than just open the doors and <laughs> sell. selling stuff to people, isn't it? Yeah, no doubt about it. There's a moment every business owner has, too, I'm sure, where, or I could speak as a manager, when you order something and you're thinking, whether I sell this or not, oh. I just spent this money and yeah. I don't need to make it back, right? Doesn't it kind of hit you in the pit of your stomach, doesn't it? Yeah. We have our different order days and it's very scary at first to know. <laughs> like at, at, at first we didn't even know what kind of, well, it was our first time, so we didn't really know what kind of snacks to buy or what kind of fruits or what kind right. of t-shirts or anything that were, would actually sell. So it's really, it's something I think that really helps us with like entrepreneurship too. It's just to take a risk. And yeah. it's, I, li I like it, it's really cool. Sure. It's really great because from year to year, the kids get to see things in the charger shop that they have had an influence on. Sometimes they're in my classes, sometimes they're not. At the end of every school year, um, the reps come in from Under Armour and Gear and Nike and they pitch their products to the kids. And the staff comes in and looks at the staff items, but the kids really decide what we're gonna sell. And it has been just amazing this year. Um, for the first time, we have some Charger football shirts. I had now the quarterback um, in one of my sales classes, and he said, oh, you need to put Hit Pride Win on the back. That's something I would not have known, that that was the, the theme for the, the football slogan, team, yeah. the <laughs> slogan. And so it's been hugely successful. The more you listen to your target market, the better it is. But, you know, it's always a risk. Sometimes we purchase things that we think are going to be great, and they're not. And we learn from that as well. Sure. You know, there's always a lesson, and I think that's the great thing. You know, and as a teacher, you know, and I'm sure you've had this experience in class, the debrief is almost more important than what comes before, right? <laughs> right, it's like, absolutely. Okay, now, so, so this happens, so what? So what do we learn about that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, what do you get? You've had some different experiences. You've had different experiences from each other in this class. What are you looking forward to uh, the most, or what are you looking forward to a lot uh, this school year from your, your classes here? Um. And in my sales class, I think what I'm looking forward to most is just working the charger shop every week. I really enjoyed it this week, and I, I like being the cashier and working the, working with the money and helping customers out. That was a lot of fun. There's a lot of energy, isn't there? Yeah, there it's, is. You have to be on your toes. You have to be active and involved, right? Mm -hmm. That's great. How about for you, Elena? Well, there's a program at Northwood, actually, of the Young Entrepreneurs Academy that um, I applied for last year, and I got in. And I think that the charger shop experience and the whole sales and management experience is actually really, really, really going to be useful for me um, because we're going to write our new business plan and everything. And by actually being in the scene, you realize all of the things that you need to take care of, too. So everyone you need to order from, all the image, everything. And it's, I think that if I hadn't had this experience, my business plan for the Young Entrepreneurs Academy would have been so just plain, you know. Sure. You wouldn't have been as prepared. Exactly. No doubt. Yeah. Well, last question for you guys. Tell me about or tell us about uh, after high school. Any thoughts or ideas about uh, what's next for you? You can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, as far as after high school, 
um, when I go to college, I'm gonna I'm planning on going into something business or accounting related. I'm also in a, enrolled in an accounting class right now, but I think the skills that I'm learning from my business classes right now are definitely gonna help me. Um, sure invaluable knowledge I've learned from them so far. You know there's things about it you like already. Yeah. And it kind of gives you a head sure. start, doesn't it? So, great. And later? Um, I also want to enter a business field. I want to be, um, I want to study marketing and advertising. And, yeah, I think this is really going to help me. No doubt. Yep. Great. <laughs> well, Mrs. DeBoer and Jeffrey and Elena, thank you so much for talking with us thank about you. the Chargers Shop. What a, what a wonderful project-based learning activity. And it sounds like a, a great experience for all of you. Sure is. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, up next, we'll hear from the counselors in their latest Counselor's Corner, and then we'll find out what exactly the Middle School Science Club has been up to. So stick around for more MPS Today right after this. There is no place like home. Getting home safely is just a click away. But making sure your child is in the right seat is just one of the steps down the road to safer travels. I don't know how it works. Find the right seat for your little one's age and size. We saw what you told us. There's no better way to get home safely. Know for sure that your child is in the right seat. Get all the facts at safercar.gov slash the right seat. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hi, welcome to Counselor's Corner. My name is Craig Hawkins, and I'm a counselor at Midland High School, and this is Lori Hallberg, counselor at Dow High. We're here today to talk about the different things that are going on for the month of October. Uh, one of the first things that happens for students in October is there's some testing that happens. Uh, one of the first is the ninth grade MEEP. All ninth graders in both high schools will be taking this test on the same day. Uh, it's a way for us to kind of gauge how well we're doing in the social studies area. What do students know? What do we need to improve upon? So it's, it's a nice uh, assessment for us to see exactly where kids are. So all the ninth graders will get that done. Another one is the PSAT test. And I know we spoke about that last month, but actually the PSAT is given in the middle of, of October. I believe it's October 16th. And registration for that is done in the high schools. Students will pay a $15 fee and they'll go to the individual high schools and register and pay that fee. Uh, and then that will allow them to be able to take that test. It's during the day, again, October 16th. It is for juniors who are interested in taking a practice SAT test. Now that test is also used as one of the national merit qualifiers. So if a student thinks that they are really at the top of their class and they want to try for this scholarship, uh, they would need to take the PSAT. And again, that's for qualifying for the national merit. Uh, so there are some important dates coming up that we want to make sure everybody is aware of. And if you have a senior, you know that your senior is most likely busy filling out college applications. So just a reminder that applications are typically due by Halloween and that if you haven't had a chance to visit the school, it's a good thing to, to set up a tour. If you go to individual school websites, you can see when they have preset tours already arranged. But if those dates don't work for you, just call their office and see if you can arrange for your own tour. It just gives you and, you and your student a feel for what that college really is like. Is it too big? Is it too small? Or maybe it's just right for your student. Then also, the end of the marking period is going to be coming up soon, November 1st. So just make sure you stay on top of homework, projects, tests, uh, all of that. Um, it comes pretty fast. If you have any questions, you can always email teachers or counselors. All the emails are found on the directory on the MPS website. Particularly with the, with the nine-week marking periods at the high school, we've had those now for a couple of years, but sometimes that can get away from a student. Um, if they're struggling in a class, uh, the ninth grade marking period, uh, or, I'm sorry, the ninth nine-week marking period is, is a long time in that semester. You're halfway through and you need to keep track. Students need to keep track of how well they're doing. Remember, parents, you can keep track of it on home access to see whether your students are turning in materials, what their grade is at a certain point. Teachers keep that updated. So we really want parents and students to keep track of how they're doing as that ninth week marking period comes to a close. All right. 
Well, this is October's edition of Counselor's Corner. Make sure to join us again next month. Take my hand and start a brand new day. And together as one will start to see some change. Underneath everything we are, underneath everything we do, we are all people, connected, interdependent, united. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. Welcome back to the show. We're here with teachers Sharon Derees and Bernadette Wood to talk about their science club and the weather balloon project. Uh, Sharon and Bernadette, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you bet. Now, how long have you each been at MPS and uh, what do you do for us here? I'm a teacher and I've been here for 18 years. Okay and I've been at Central Middle School until this year yep. where I'm starting my new job at Jefferson Middle School. Okay, and you're a science teacher there. I am a sixth grade teacher in writing, social studies, yeah. and math this year, but science is always a love. Okay, great. And Bernadette, how about you? And I've been with Midland Public Schools for 17 years, uh, 16 of which at Central Middle School yeah. also with Sharon, and this year I am now at Northeast Middle School, okay. and I teach seventh and eighth grade science. That's a big uh, transition, right? Going from uh, Central to the Northeast and Jefferson. And, yes, it uh, is. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a big deal for everyone that's involved, for the yes. students and for the staff. Right. But it's, uh, it's a time for new beginnings too, isn't it? It so, is. And, and they've made us feel so welcome, both Jefferson and Northeast it's staff. Incredible. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, they've just been wonderful. Well, that's great. They made it easy. What I would say as a former teacher and school administrator, to have the, the quality professionals that are coming over from Central coming into your building uh, is, is a dream come true for those folks too. So I'm sure they're very well, excited. Thank you. Well, thank, you. So, thank you very much. Um, very exciting for them. Now, uh, tell us, talk about this Girls Science Club. How did the idea for that come about uh, and how do you end up choosing the girls that are involved? Well, um, the idea came about kind of with looking at a video called Hello Kitty. Okay. And uh -huh. you want to tell a little bit about that? I saw a video online uh, of seventh grade girl and her father worked on a science project together and clicked on the video on YouTube and it was a weather balloon with a little tiny Hello Kitty doll attached okay. to it sent up into near space uh, 90,000 feet and came back down they had it equipped with cameras and music and it was amazing that a seventh grade girl worked on this project with her dad for a science fair and it was very inspirational we showed it to students they loved it they were excited about it and we decided we need to do this. Yeah. And we kind of thought that we wanted to do a girls club because we had been observing for years and years um, girls in the science labs and how they sort of interact with materials and building and mm -hmm. doing engineering type processes and that they sat back a little bit more than the guys. The guys would dig in if you gave them a box full of stuff and said try to make a Rube Goldberg and the girls would sit back and like what am I supposed to do with this stuff. Yeah. So they had kind of very different learning styles at least at the middle school ages. So we thought we had kind of a special niche there that maybe we could fill that niche that the girls needed more experience to gain more confidence and maybe to um, work through a process at their own speed and in their own way on their own without the, the boys involved. Sure. Yeah. And this weather balloon project was just the ticket. Neither Bernadette nor I had any experience with her weather balloon. We knew nothing about it, so we did a tremendous amount of research at home. Mm -hmm. But knowing that the kids were excited about it and wanted mm -hmm. to do it really spurred us on. Weather balloons are used for all sorts of things, um, but we were able to teach the students that for this project, it was to be used to lift a payload with cameras and a couple of experiments into near space, and that was the only, only job there. Um, so knowing that, we had to order the huge latex weather balloon. We had right. to order helium. We purchased a kit online, a stabilizing frame. Mm -hmm. And from that, the students had to also do research. They had to learn tasks along right. the way and understand the science behind it. It worked out really well because we knew in the spring the seventh grade girls would also be studying weather and the layers of the atmosphere. So we knew that we could tie it in at that point as well. Yeah, what a great uh, multidisciplinary connection. It and turned out to be quite mm -hmm. multidisciplinary. Math, science, community relations, yes, yes yeah. all kinds Arts of things. Arts and crafts, yes. soldering, you name Isn't it. Isn't that one of the, the, I always found as an educator and as a teacher, that's one of the greatest things about the job, about the, 
the about the mission that we have in schools, isn't it? Is that the kids always keep you learning, always keep you, always oh, yeah. keep things new and fresh? Because mm -hmm. there's always something to learn. There's always something to explore together. Right? It was just as exciting for us as it was sure. for for the kids. I mean, it was wonderful to be learning something brand new, and to wake up in the morning and be excited about that, right. And, right. and share that with not just the girls club, but with all of the students in our classes and eventually the entire school. Yeah, and we saw teachers. other kids mm -hmm. and other teachers get excited about this. Right. So having a project that wasn't a kit, that wasn't a prescription, that wasn't a list of follow these directions and do this. It's even better, right? In this allotted time was, it was amazing. It's well, like, I'm sorry, go ahead. Bring well, it's like truly problem-based learning. Right. You know, we had a problem. Mm -hmm. We wanted to send a weather balloon up. We knew nothing about it. We had to do all of our research, all of our problems had to be solved. Mm -hmm. We made a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. along the way, but we learned from them, and we learned that, you know, grit and tenacity are also very important skills that we have to teach in schools, right. and, and there was a very natural process with that, too. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. You know, some of the, the best learning our students do doesn't come from a textbook. In fact, probably a lot of the best uh -huh. learning. Maybe mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that as a social studies and English person, but it, it is true, right? I mean, we want them to live yeah. that grit and the tenacity, those 21st century learning skills, mm -hmm. working together to solve a problem. After all, that's what we're confronted with every day. Every and day. Folks mm -hmm. in the workforce right. are confronted with, and that's what our students need to be successful at. And these girls came in on their lunch hours. They mm -hmm. came in after school to do this. None of this was done during the school day. And that was fun to see, too, where they were right. excited and they would stop us in the hallway asking, yeah. when, are, when we are, are we meeting, meeting? again? Yeah. What are we doing today? And it's, we were doing science and math. Right. But they were excited about That's it. That's every teacher's dream, right? The kids Absolutely. want to be there. Absolutely. No That's doubt. right. Absolutely. That's right. Well, let's talk about that. What did the girls do? I mean, what were their, uh, what were the steps they had to take, and, and what were they doing to, to make this happen? When we initially met and we showed them the Hello Kitty video, we started a brainstorming session and um, of what did they want to do, and did they think they could do this, and how did they want to pull it off, and what might it look like. So it was all very girl-driven. And um, they decided to launch it, you know, kind of to honor the closing of Central Middle School. Okay. And so they had lots of little projects that they went along the way with. And we realized um, and kind of knew in advance that they needed to be assigned to teams, that not everybody can do everything. So the first thing they had to learn was, you know, we had to compartmentalize um, the jobs that had to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, one group was going to uh, kidnap the squirrel of a teacher because we wanted to send the squirrel up to space okay. and uh, another group was experimenting with um, a confetti drop so they had to design a scientific experiment to figure out how we could do an environmentally friendly confetti drop from our payload. Uh, another group had to figure out how to um, access satellite um, mapping and weather data mm -hmm. because we needed to learn about the jet stream. We needed to learn about um, when the jet stream was over Michigan. Our big goal was to not land our balloon in uh, Lake Huron yeah. because it, they found the jet stream always um, you know, heads toward Lake mm -hmm. Huron and uh, we didn't want to lose our balloon in the water. We also had to figure out how we going to find it once it lands. Right. So we were really at the beginning stages of everything, and they were all assigned tasks to do, and um, many of them designed their own experiments with lift. You know, how much helium does it take to lift right. a payload of a certain weight? And the excitement was incredible because they were coming to us saying, can we do experiments over the weekend? We're like, yeah. sure. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of excitement yeah. was just infectious to everybody. So it was very girl-driven. Of course, mm -hmm. once we got into it, you know, we knew where the jobs were, and they, they just followed in. One girl knew how to solder because she had been involved in the ham radio club at Central mm -hmm. Middle School. Sure. And um, then that allowed us to make a connection mm -hmm. to some community resources also. Uh-huh. Great. Now, I heard a rumor, and this, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think I'm going to. I, I, heard, I heard a rumor that maybe you created an international <laughs> incident here with the, uh, with the Weather Balloon Project and the Middle School Girls Science Club. Have so you gotten a call yet? Has, has, have Homeland you heard from the Security governor? Homeland Security has not contacted <laughs> They have not contacted no. you, perhaps. No, the no. Canadian no. minister has not. No, no. We, we no. haven't heard a thing. Well, so far, so happened? good. Well, that, this is one of those things where Bernadette mentioned earlier, certain problems arose that we had to deal with yeah. because science is messy, as Bernadette mm -hmm. likes to say, mm -hmm. and things happen. When the balloon went to launch, it didn't launch. The payload was too heavy. Mm -hmm. There were too many cameras, too many batteries. And we as teachers knew that the night before, 
but we weren't going to fix that because this was the girls project. We did eventually fix that just by tearing some things out um, <laughs> and it, it did eventually lift but because of that slow ascent rate it didn't hit the jet stream as soon as it was predicted to and it veered well off course. Yes it did and we were at Vassar and Vassar at McDonald's waiting for it to land in Vassar because we had to do a prediction map mm -hmm. and we had predicted that that's where it would land but because of the slow ascent it needs to go to 90,000 feet and then it bursts and then it comes down. Okay. Well it never did make 90,000 feet so it drifted and while we avoided Lake Huron um, we, <laughs> never, we never went over a body of water but we did manage to go over the Canadian border. There it just go. kept going and going and going. And did and, you notice? Uh, did you have a tracker on it or something? Yes. Or, okay. um, the Ham Radio Club here in Midland, Midland Amateur Radio Club, um, began working with us fairly early on and said that they would track the balloon for us. Okay. And then Midland County Rescue um, also got involved mm -hmm. and they said they would like to use it as a training exercise. And so we had all of these wonderful community members right. helping us locate this balloon. And so we were all sitting in McDonald's looking at our computer as it went over the border, and we all yeah. got very quiet. <laughs> I don't and, think they have uh, jurisdiction there, do they? No. no. And in no. fact, they didn't even know any ham radio people over there to okay. try to, you know, they said they had wanted that connection but didn't have it yet. So what so happened next? We began predicting, is it going to make it to New York? Is it going mm -hmm. to Pennsylvania? Yeah. Is it going into the Atlantic? Where is it going to go? Because... Technically, uh, it, it wasn't going to pop, uh, but eventually, and because of these amazing community members we had with us, many of, all of whom were scientists, either yes. chemical engineers or physicists or, or what have you, um, they were calculating the volume and the pressures and the temperatures, and all of their calculations showed the balloon wouldn't burst they were able to teach the girls this. So these 12 year old girls who were with us, five or six of them at that time at McDonald's, yeah. were learning about math and chemistry and physics Applying at McDonald's. Real world Very problems. applied. Yes, mm -hmm. right. while they're eating, eating fries and, right. and enjoying themselves. <laughs> um, but luckily the cold was on our side. The latex balloon froze at some point mm -hmm. and it did burst. And it landed literally on the shores of Lake Erie. A couple of hundred feet off the shores of Lake Erie okay. and that was our other concern that we would again have a water landing and right. lose hundreds of dollars worth of mm -hmm. equipment off of the sure. off of the payload. But we fortunately, um, Jenny Lennon over at Central, Central Middle School was all monitoring it. Mm -hmm. yeah. She contacted a high school that was very close to where we thought the balloon was but we couldn't figure out, it didn't land, it was up in the air still but, we, mm -hmm. and, but it wasn't moving anymore. So we weren't sure if it wasn't actually sending signal out. We weren't sure. Right. They contacted a high school. Um, I talked to the teacher <laughs> there. He said, wow, we're a geoscience class, and we just learned to use right. GPS trackers. We would love to go find your balloon. So uh, we gave them latitude and longitude, and they were going to go the next day. The custodian there belonged to the local Mariners Club. He okay. had called them up and said, please check the water for this pink box, bright pink box floating in the water with a balloon attached. And so um, we, he was out there looking. And then unbeknownst to us, there was a ham radio operator. All across Canada, ham radio operators mm -hmm. had actually picked the signal up. Oh. And they didn't know what it was. And they eventually figured out it might be a weather balloon. But he was at the end of the line. He went out and looked for it. Um, he ended up meeting the high school teacher who updated him on coordinates. And he was able to find the balloon that night and gave us a call, the oddest call we'd ever received. Mm -hmm wanting us to tell him how to turn the beeper off because we had an audio beeper on okay. it that was just obnoxiously loud. So he found the payload and then uh, Sharon had to take it from there because passports were now required. Yes. So several days later my family went and met in Sarnia to pick up the payload okay. and the radio operator in Canada was thrilled. He wanted to keep the payload for a couple of days so that he could take it and actually show the radio club. Uh, according to him, a lot of things come across the border, but they're usually just a tiny little computer chip tracking de device tied to a balloon on a wire, and they've got several of these. They haven't ever gotten this triangular shaped right. mm -hmm. payload. Pink. So they were thrilled to get that, and they saw the girls' names signed on to it yeah. and, and all of their little messages on it, Great story too. for them, too. So. Great for them. 
and they are so knowledgeable is, is what we've learned through this process and the girls have learned too. Mm -hmm. The ham radio operators, Midland County Search and Rescue, as well as the people in Canada are so excited about what they do, they are thrilled to teach people about it. And mm -hmm. we found that they're all incredible teachers. Yeah. Yes, yes. On, on so many different levels. So it's, it, it was really a lot of fun. It and was. so exciting for the girls to see their science project go across the border. Right, yeah. Yeah. You know, that that was a thrill. Layer. Now you got right. social studies involved, too. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, uh, you've launched another balloon since then, or, or no, are you about to? Or what's... We attempted another balloon okay. launch, and we had uh, what NASA calls an anomaly occur. Okay. It got away from us oh. without the payload. Oh, so, no. um, yep, this is what messy science yeah, is about. Happens. And um, so we're, we'll be attempting again soon. Mm -hmm. We just are looking for okay. funds right now, and, and then we'll try again in the next mm -hmm. couple months. Well, to what launch. are your goals? Sorry to, to interrupt, but what are your goals for the program moving forward? We want girls, these middle school students and high school students, to become comfortable with tinkering around with things, sure. with the STEM area, the science, the technology, with engineering, with making something out of nothing. We want them to say, that's a cool project, let's do it, mm -hmm. and be able to dive in and learn how to do it, ask questions, ask for help, and keep coming back to it and, and keep making things work and work and work until you get what you need. Right. And real specifically, we want to work on computer programming. Um, we have these small computers called Raspberry Pis that are $36 computers, okay. and, uh, but you have to know how to program them, mm -hmm. and Python is the language. Um, the benefit for our weather balloon project is that they're incredibly light. And right now we're trying to use a Lab Pro, which is very heavy, and it's very difficult to get that that yeah. weight up with the balloon. So we want to learn to program these computers. Um, they're very versatile. You can use them to program an alarm system on your house, uh -huh. the stereo system. You can use them to design clothes that light up, you know, safety or for fun. So there's a, just a lot of different ways to go with it. The girls will have a lot of choice. Sure. So that's, that's a big goal for this year. Well, it sounds like you have a great group of girls that you're working with. Mm -hmm. uh, if a parent is watching or a student is watching, they want to get involved. Are there spots available? Do they have to apply? I mean, how would this uh -huh. work for someone who's interested? We're looking for teacher recommendations. And okay. we know at the beginning of the year, teachers might not know all of the kids. We're going to give it about a month and uh -huh. then um, announce to the, or ask the teachers for recommendations, ask the girls who's interested. You know, they need to be pretty self-directed. They need to be interested in science, mm -hmm. willing to do some things on their own. Right. Um, you know, in the interest of flipped classrooms or flipped clubs oh. here, you know, some of the computer programming, learning it, there's a lot of things online that you can do on your own. Um, so that's who we're going to be looking for, kids that were very okay. directed and very motivated. So if I'm a parent or a student who's interested, should go and uh, talk with teachers, maybe find one of you at, the, at Jefferson. Definitely or, find, or find one of us. Yeah. Yes. And uh, you can mm -hmm. fill them in on all the details. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Well, well, maybe we'll go ahead and uh, we'll have Billy put up your emails uh, if people want to contact great, you. Great, great. Thank great. you. Great, we'd love right. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what a wonderful program. Uh, and it sounds like uh, a great group of girls to work with, a great oh. group of, uh, of students. So let's go out in the field and meet them and find out what their impressions are of the program. Okay, Sounds great. good. All right, let's head out. All right, we're here at Dow High School to meet with Kelly DeReese, Megan Dean, and Michelle Nitz to talk about the Middle School Science Club. And as we're learning, it's actually the Middle School and High School Girls Science Club. Uh, Kelly and Megan and Michelle, welcome to the show. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. But now tell us a little bit about the club. What are you calling it now? Operation uh, Go Pi. Operation and, Go Pi. Yes, and the Go stands for girls only. It's just a girls club. All right, good. And Pi stands for? It's just Pi like. Raspberry one four. Yeah. Four. Yeah. Three point one four one five nine. Yeah. The number pi because originally we started we were gonna work and program Raspberry Pi. Uh it's a computer. It's a little computer. It's computer. About sure. Um we haven't had time to work with the program and get that started yet, but that's definitely in our future. Okay. Well before we get into all that, tell us a little bit about yourselves. You're you're all students here at, at Dow High School. What year in school are you? I'm a junior. I'm a senior. And I'm a senior. Okay. And uh, what do you, I'm sure you, I've heard you're all excellent students. Outside of the classroom, what do you like to do with your, uh, with your time? Uh, well, there's band. Yeah. Um, I play French horn. And so for marching season, I play mellophone. And key club, I'm president of key club this year. Okay. So that takes up a lot of That'll keep my you on time. your toes, for yeah. sure, yeah. 
Uh, I am also in the band. I play the saxophone, and during marching season, I'm a senior drum major. So that takes up a lot of time, and I also participate in jazz band and NHS, and I teach dance classes yeah. at the community center. So Great. Michelle? I'm also in a band. Yeah. <laughs> I play French horn, and so I'm in the marching band, too. That takes a lot of time. Sure it does. But I also do cross country and track. I like to run a lot, and uh, reading is one of my favorite things. Too. Okay. I don't know how you manage all that with your school schedules as well, but it sounds like you're busy. Well, tell us a little bit about Operation Go Pie and the Science Club. Uh, you know, how did, it, how did it come about and how did your involvement start? Well, my mom is Sharon DeReese and she was the one okay. that had the original idea. She wanted to do something with the Raspberry Pi computers, as Megan mentioned. And eventually she got the idea of doing a weather balloon from a video yeah. on YouTube um, that had a girl who launched a Hello Kitty to the edge of space with a weather balloon. So that started that, and we ended up forming this group, and it, the focus was mainly on weather balloons. Okay. And tell us about the payload that you've been working on. Now, you've launched, you've attempted several launches, mm -hmm. and now you're working on a, another one. Is that correct? Yes. Our last launch didn't go successfully. Our yeah. balloon had a leak in it, and we actually put in way much more we found that out because we put way more helium than we needed in the okay. balloon afterwards we found that out yeah. but uh the box we have constructed is out of just styrofoam and um uh, some bonding agent to seal it all together because we can construct it ourselves and then it's got uh pink fluorescent paint on the outside so you can stand if you get gets caught in a tree you can see it sure. because it shines and there's also um neon spray paint uh, that is glow in the dark. So worst case scenario, if it's dark out, we could find it. Nice. And it's got all these different attachments that goes on the frame. Um, we have a science experiment currently on there with that is a solar panel hooked up to a lab pro inside. And then we have different forms of cameras and it's a beeper. So a we beeper. can find it. Yeah. Right. Anything else I missed? Um, sounds yeah, sounds like there's a lot so. of attention on making sure it can be found once yeah. it's yes. launched. And, uh, yeah. We want it back. And lands. And I think we've got Billy taking some pictures of it. So as we're talking, yeah. she'll be showing some pictures for us too. Now, you mentioned helium. How does the weather balloon get up in the air? Uh, tell us about how high it goes. How do you find it to get it back? What about all that? Well, it goes up because helium is lighter than air. So sure. it has lift. It goes up. How fast does it go up? Um, supposed to go up about 1,600 feet per second. Okay. And it goes up to, wow. supposed to go up to 90,000 feet. Our first one only went up to like 51,000. But um, to find it, you know, what she already said. Yeah, the so, neon yeah. paint and with the beeper, the beeper is the big thing because you hear that. And it's loud. Yeah, it's loud. <laughs> What it about, doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. It keeps no. going. Yeah. Someone's yeah. going gonna to find it to yeah. turn it up. Yeah. It's like those uh, little speakers in the gas station trying to pump gas. They keep talking at you. Mm -hmm. right? Now, how do you, how do you track? It must be a tracking device of some sort as well. Right. There's a tracking device. Um, we have the ham radio tracking device. Okay. And then on our first launch, we had a track with matters on it too. But did that? Yeah, yeah that was a GPS. And yeah. we had it mounted out on the frame out here. And it stopped tracking a couple of minutes after we launched and set our last location to Central Middle School, which was our launch site, and yeah. then an update. And so we went completely off of the ham radio APRS tracking system for both launches. Now, that, is that, was that the Canadian launch that we heard about? The Canadian the first uh, landing? Yes, yeah. the yeah. first Canadian launch. So what was that like? Tell, take us there a little bit. What was that like for you when you were just wondering what was going to happen? Well, the day started out kind of interesting because when we tried to lift up the balloon we had all this stuff on it more than we probably needed and the balloon didn't want to lift so as the balloon was kind of at a standstill just a little bit above the ground we started ripping stuff off of it we lost some cameras <laughs> yeah we lost our, our science experiment yeah. and stuff all our ads all our, yeah. yeah all our ads just we wanted to take off as much added weight as we could to make it go up faster and make sure it cleared the trees and the posts around sure. central middle school um, and then Kelly went on the um, yep. chase I, after it. Yeah. I went um, and joined a few of the middle school girls, and we went to a McDonald's in Vassar where we met the ham radio guys, and we tracked it from there because uh, we saw that it was traveling further than it was supposed to because right. of the weight issue, and it had a slower ascent rate, so it was up in the air longer. It was going farther than we expected, and so we stopped in Vassar, 
and tracked it from there, and that was where we were watching it cross the Canadian border, getting yeah. awfully close to Lake Erie. <laughs> yeah. So that was, you had two things going on, right? Because you had Canada, which you weren't anticipating, and then you definitely didn't want it in Lake Erie, yeah. right? So. Right. And then we well, were worried about it landing in the bay, but it went all the way to Lake Erie. Yeah. yeah. And Kelly was off chasing while we were off at school, yep. um, getting messages about how... <laughs> where is it now? Yeah, where is it now? And she's like, in Canada, and we're like, what? Yeah. She was texting you, and you like updated me. Yeah, I was like, get your passports out. Yeah, we're <laughs> going to Canada. The Homeland Security never called though, so that's no. yeah. Thing, right? so, now, you received all sorts of data back. What kind of data did you get, and what were you able to do with that? Uh, well, while we were tracking it, we had the APRS data packets coming back, and that included temperature, altitude, the speed, um, location, and that was the data that we had along with footage from the videos, the cameras, and we would have had data from our solar cell, but that had to be taken off on right. the first one. So the only data we really had was from the APRS system. Okay. We did get a little bit of camera footage too from the cameras that we had left intact. Mm -hmm. We had a picture, uh, footage of a squirrel as it ascended. <laughs> it was a yeah. fake squirrel. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Um, but we got to see that as it went up. So we saw a little bit, we didn't get to see the outer space view because it was too heavy, yeah. but didn't we're hoping next there. time. Sure. Definitely. Well, let's look ahead to next time. Right? There's another launch planned at some point. It's not, we don't have a date yet because we don't have a balloon either, yeah. so. Yeah, okay. we're working on getting a balloon and we want to make it bigger. I think, well, yep, we, had, we want a bigger balloon. All right. We had, I think, what was it, a 100 gram balloon or 600, 600, 600, 600 gram yeah. balloon, we want to go to which starts at about six feet in diameter on the ground. And then as it rises and the um, atmospheric pressure decreases, the balloon expands to the mm. point where it can't hold the helium and it bursts. And that's when it the payload comes down sure. and the burst diameter for a 600 gram balloon is 20 feet and um, with a bigger balloon the 1200 it can carry more weight and it's obviously bigger harder to handle but we're gonna try it <laughs> yeah. we figured that'll give us less to worry about weight on here and we can make sure we have all our devices that right. we want to go up and it's the third launch so might as well try yeah. what we That's need right. third time's a charm exactly <laughs> That'll be perfect. What have you learned so far, you know, from the, the couple launches that you've had, you're planning your next one? What, do, what are the, some of the lessons that you've learned along the way? Definitely the first one, we didn't have a checklist for anything, and we needed that because we turned the beep okay. on, I think, like 20 minutes earlier. It was so <laughs> annoying. <laughs> Probably made it harder to think about everything yeah. else that we were going to And it was just kind of chaotic. The GoPro about. camera didn't, didn't turn on. get didn't turned, get turned on, on, which is our really expensive camera yeah, that can yeah. handle anything. And yeah. we were really looking forward to that view, but we didn't get to have didn't that. Didn't get anything. And definitely the biggest problem was we didn't have a checklist to weigh it beforehand, mm. so it yeah. was too heavy. We weren't very careful about the weight the okay. first time. So yeah. these are all things that you've uh, you're going to apply in your next launch, Definitely. obviously. Second launch, actually. Yeah, yeah we, we already we started, had a yeah, we had checklists and everything. Didn't and go up. Yeah. <laughs> the weights we still watched carefully. We did it multiple times yeah. with different scales. And did very careful lift calculations so that we knew mm -hmm. exactly how much helium we should need, mm -hmm. how much weight we really needed to lift. That's why Megan made the box because she chose a super light, yeah, yeah. plastic. So sure. Well, looking forward for you, uh, you've got one or two years left in high school here. Are, are, is science in the future for you all, or is this just a hobby? What do you, where do you think you're headed with uh, what, what you've learned here? Um, well, it's definitely in the future for me. I'd like to go into engineering, probably aerospace, because I like things that can fly, and yeah. rockets can fly in space and everything. So the weather balloon is a perfect application of that interest. Absolutely. And the Megan, for you? Uh, I'm actually probably going to go into the um, Medicare um, hospital fields, pharmaceutical, okay. um, but engineering, I just love building things and seeing things work because in the group, I'm always the one that's like, try it, let's do it. Why do you have to do those calculations? <laughs> let's see what happens. <laughs> so that's, I, I honestly just love working with them and yeah. uh, participating and seeing it all play out. Sure. Yeah. I think engineering definitely is in my future. And that's basically the reason why I decided to start doing this because we were starting out, we were going to use the Raspberry Pi and I was in program class and I was thinking like, maybe I'll do this in my future. Right. We didn't end up using it, but it's still a really good experience to like learn how to like work in a team and make sure everything works and fixing mistakes the second time. Sure. And that collaboration, learning from the experience, uh, even just 
the logical sequential thought process that you have to go through. You can apply that in any field, right? So. Yeah. Well, it's great. Well, it sounds like a very exciting event, and uh, we wish you all the best of luck in your next adventure with the weather balloon and everything else you got coming your way. Thanks. Thank all you. All right. Well, that's our show for today. Uh, remember that you can watch the show on your local cable channel 98, also on UVerse channel 99, and our YouTube site, which you can access at www.youtube.com slash user slash Midland Public Schools, also at www.midps slash YouTube. Have a great October, and we'll see you next time on MPS Today.